over 130 residential schools operated in Canada. The first federal residential school began around 1883, the last closed in 1996. These schools, predominantly funded and operated by the Government of Canada and Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, and United Churches, were created to enforce the adoption of European traditions, languages, and lifestyles by First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children. To better understand the history of these schools and what it meant to Indigenous communities, we invited residential school attendees and their families to share their stories and experiences. For some, these stories are a moment of healing. For others, a chance to talk about the history and the system. All are important to preserve for future generations. My name is Ryan Funk, and with my co-host Lisa Muswagon, we followed these stories for We Stand Together. Flora, we're so excited to have you on our show today. Um, we're really grateful to have you here. Um, my name is Lisa Maswigan and I'm from the Michigamac Cree Nation, also known as Cross Lake. My parents come from Northern Manitoba. Um, where my community is, is where the St. Joseph's Residential School was. So I do, I am familiar with uh, residential school survivors and their stories. And um, I've been, I participated in the um, search project in my community. So again, I'm so grateful for you to take your time to be on this episode of We Stand Together. Good morning. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> invite you to Treaty 6 Territory. The land, you know, the people of the Plains Cree. The uh, I'll do a little bit of my introduction in in Cree. I'll say my uh, my Cree name. Kamiago, Kamiago, Pernitsika, Asun. My Cree name is a pretty blanket. I was born in Muscatees, in a tent. I love to tell my story when I, when I um, introduce myself. My great grandmother was my, was the midwife for my mom and my grandmother. So the day when I was born was, there was four generations. I was the fourth generation at the time. And I was born in a tent in a cold, cold January. And um, then my Cree name was given to me by my great grandfather on my father's side. My mom, my parents were, you know, they, they grew up in Muscatis. So as a little girl, growing up with my parents, my grandparents, I spoke Cree fluently. And uh, <clears throat> by the time I was six, five years old, I went to day school. It was a church, not far from where we live, about a, maybe about a, a mile and a half away from here. And my dad used to take us on a, on a caboose a team of horses in the winter and at springtime we used to run you know we used to run to the school because it was only just across the field and wasn't that far and I, I, I enjoyed going to school at the time at the, at the church you know I, I did learn a little bit of English not enough to get by at the time I was only five years old by the time I was six years old that's when my parents took me to the residential school. This was their uh, Urban Skin Indian Residential School. And that was like maybe about five miles away from my house. And I remember I was just kicking and screaming and not never been exposed to the, except to the church. And, you know, that was the only Ex, you know, that was the only place that I was exposed to, to the, to the white world, to the white people, because I never, I never um, 
There wasn't that many white people around at the time. But when I went to the school, I guess that's when I first experienced my trauma. Because I was told at six years old, you don't speak your language. And if you do, you know, they'll, you'll get hit. I think that was the only time that woman talked to me in Cree. And I don't remember too much about my early childhood at the residential school. The only thing I remember is the fear, the trauma, the loneliness. As time went on, I learned as I got a little bit older, I had to learn fast. I had to learn how to take care of myself. I had to learn to make the bed because if you didn't make your bed, you got into trouble and you had to start all over again. And, um, you know, I learned, the other thing that I learned was uh, never to, you know, to try and do the best I can and to try and learn and watch some of the things that I had to do. You know, when I talk about trauma and in the early childhood, for me, because of I, you know, because of how I was introduced to the school by screaming and kicking and crying, and how that lady, when my mom and dad left me, before they left me, that lady told me I couldn't speak in, and I couldn't speak Cree. And uh, I thought, I don't remember much. I think I might have shut down after that because, and she told me that if I could get caught speaking the language that I would get into trouble. But I don't think I was warned enough. There wasn't enough warning as to what kind of trouble you would get if you got caught speaking the language. And then I got to see the kids getting strapped and then one day I got caught speaking the language too and I got strapped and I was crying. I think I got strapped a few times until somebody told me, said, learn not to cry when you get strapped because the more you cry, you'll get more straps. So I had to learn not to cry when my hands were getting strapped. And it's pretty painful, you know, with, with that strap. I think every nun that worked at the school at the time and the priests, I think every one of them had a, a strap with them because you knew regardless where you were in a school, if you were out in the playgrounds, if you get caught speaking your language, you, you know, you were going to get it. And, you know, even the way they would talk to us, you know, we were, I was a number, never one, you know, I believe my number was 62. I grew up with that number till the day I left school. And it was, uh, as we went, as we, as I went, as I went on with my education, you know, we had, we didn't have the greatest teachers because these nuns were French speakers. And we had to sound out the words exactly how they, you know, how they were trying to teach us the English terminology. 
my English was not the greatest because it was with an accent with the French in, you know, with it. So, you know, I had a hard time learning the English language, but I had to learn, you know, the things that, that took place, the work from the time we got up in the morning, we had to make our beds. It was this constant prayer from morning till night. Everything that we did, we had to pray. We'd get into trouble. We'd have to go in a corner and kneel down and say a few Hail Marys. And, and then if you were, if it, I don't know what, I don't know how bad sometimes we got into trouble, but they would get us up early in the morning, maybe five o'clock in the morning to go to church, six o'clock. And then, you know, we learn how to lie. Because, you know, some, we'd be sent to go, you know, do the, to go and do our confessions. We had to lie, what kind of sin we committed, what we did, how many Hail Marys we had to say, you know, we would be forgiven. You know, we learn all these skills because there was just no other way to, you know, for them, because we were known to be, to them, we were savages. We were pagans. And they used to make fun of our, of our elders, you know, the, um, I always remember this one nun, she would stand on a banister and she would, in the morning, and, you know, she'd be pretending that she's singing away, you know, a powwow song or something. And, and yet we weren't even allowed to sing any of that. At nights were the worst, could hear kids crying, real, you know, under the blankets. I remember one night I was in a little girl's dorm. It was this night watchman. I always had the biggest fear with this man. So I don't remember much about that guy. As I got a little bit older, there was the priest. As girls, we used to group up together and if it, if it was recess, we would go stand together. And he would come over and try to put his hands around us. And we used to call him, you know, the priest with many hands, with wandering hands. Because he was a pedophile. And we never trusted that priest. And he used to speak Cree, eh? I couldn't stand him. And he used to smoke cigarettes and uh, I could never, you know, I hated him. For some reason, you know, this man was somebody that I didn't trust. Sometimes I, I question because there's times I have flashbacks of him. Sometimes I can smell the cigarette smoking. Sometimes I can feel the hand. You don't know what to say. You don't know who to tell. You don't know what the sisters would say if you were to tell them what this priest was trying to do. You know, I never wanted to be alone near him. I always had to make sure that I was always with somebody. And I didn't dare go alone anywhere, especially outside. But the way he used to talk to us in Cree, my child, my child, that was one priest but also the sisters, the nuns, they were 
they were there, they were always watching. One little mistake, you got a strap. But you know, when we used to get those straps, we learned not to cry. We were able to tolerate that pain. The food that we had was burnt porridge sometimes, runny porridge in the morning. Toast was very dry, bread was dry. You know, we never had good food. And yet school had gar gardens, they had chickens, they had milk, they had cows. We got to drink the milk, but we, you know, we never ate the eggs. And the bread that we ate was so, you know, stale bread, probably moldy too. You know, one of the things that I, I do give thanks to the residential school, every morning we would line up and they'd give us that cod liver oil every morning. So I was always healthy. The work that we learned from the time we were small, you know, we, everything had to be perfect because if you didn't, you had to do it all over again. So I had to learn to do things right from the beginning because I didn't want to go back and do it over again. So I would take my time to, to scrub the floor on my hands and knees and we'd all, we would all be in a row. And if one girl didn't do it right, she'd have to go back and start all over again till her floor was as equal as us. And this used to be Saturdays when some of the kids used to go home for weekends. And some of us that didn't go home on weekends would have to stay at the school and clean the school. It was a lot of labor work. We learned how to work. They made sure that we got the work done. There were some outside teachers that came to the school as I got older and there was a a home ec teacher that came. She was really nice. She taught us a lot, you know, how to set up dining room, you know, dining rooms and not knowing all the skills that we were being taught were the skills that we were going to be using as we got out of school. But I didn't know that the teachings that they taught, you know, what they taught us was what we could use once we left the school. I didn't know that. We ended, there, there was a time that we had a 4-H club at the school as we got older, maybe about 14, 15. So here we were doing some arts and craft and then they would send our work to the, to the exhibition. There was a lot of, we, they did, you know, they, they taught us a lot of good skills. But one of the things that I talk about, if you got into trouble before supper, your supper was taken away from you. And we used to call this basement, this root cellar, the dungeon. That's where they used to send us. We'd go, we'd go spend our time there from supper time till before bedtime. So we had to sort out potatoes. There was a big potato bin there and we had to sort out the potatoes there. So our supper was raw potatoes. We made sure that we we, you know, we took the little ones. They had a pantry there. So we got to learn how to steal peanut butter. So we had peanut butter and raw potatoes for our supper. We never really went hungry when we were, when we were sent to the basement to the root cellar. But then one day the pantry was locked Then we didn't have any more peanut butter. We just had to eat raw potatoes. Some of the things that I noticed, there was things happening in the dorm. And then I, I found out what it was. We were being sexually abused during the night. And that was probably my most biggest fear in a dorm as I got a little bit older at about 14, 15 years old. And this was older girls, not only the priest, but now it was the older girls that were going around abusing us. And that was one of the things that I couldn't sleep. I wasn't sure if it was going to be my night. And that's how it was. 
couldn't tell anybody. I had to keep everything to myself and not tell anybody. So when I left the school, I think I had a good record of being a good cleaner and a good worker. And, and when I left, that darn priest came back to my mom's and asked my mom if I could go out and work, be a living babysitter. And my mom talked to me, said, you want to go and work? And they said, she, they're going to pay you. I asked her how much, $60 a month. And my mom said, well, you should go. I'll be okay, because my dad had passed away. I said, okay, I'll go. I'll help you with, you know, with food. So that's what I did. The $60 that I made, I gave her half. So she'd get groceries for the kids. I worked with this couple for over a year. That was one of the things that they taught us was to be. Today, they're called nannies. Back then, we were the living babysitters. Then I learned, too, that some of the older girls had left to go and work in a hotels as chambermaids. And some of them went to Banff, Lake Louise. You know, this is what they got. They got us ready for the workforce. That I don't regret because I started working from the time I was 16 years old. As time went on, I, I left the school at about a grade, grade eight. As time went on in my life, I, I went back to school. I did some upgrading. I was still helping my mom. Then there was a, you know, then my life changed when I had my first child as a single parent. So I went back to work as a living babysitter with my baby at the time. I was always trying my best to do what I, you know, what I can do, how I can survive. And I did. I was able to train at a hospital to be a nursing assistant. And I loved it. My first um, in good employment were that was one of my goals was to be a nurse, but because of my education, I, I couldn't make it. But I ended up taking a, a nursing assistant training and I worked at the hospital for a while. As time went on, I had three more, I had four kids all together. And then life changed, alcohol set in. I was still working, mind you, work and party. My mom was there to look after my kids. Then one day I was getting out of control with my, with my drinking. And I decided to do something about it to sober up. And I told my boss, I gotta go. You know, I wanna take some time off. He gave me that time off and told me, when you're done with your program, he said, come back and I'll give you a raise. I said, okay, but I never did. I never went back to my work, my job. I ended up working at a detox center. Then from there, I started, became a community health representative. Then I went back to college and I did my social work. This was in 1992 when I did the study of the residential school. I thought if only I knew, you know, I couldn't get away from this study because that was one of my studies for the social work. So when we did this, did this residential school. There was no back and out because now the book was open. You know, everything was in there. What happened? Because there was a time in my life I said I would never want to drink. I never wanted to be an alcoholic. When I went for treatment in 1974, I extended my treatment for five days met with a psychologist, wanted to know why I became an alcoholic. I didn't have an answer then, but I stayed sober. Now this is in 1992, when we did the study of the residential school. That's when it opened up everything. 
the trauma, the physical, the emotional, the psychological, the physical, sexual abuse. That's where it was. And the anger that I went through to do that study because being a victim, I had to go back and relive the life of that young, that little girl, that young woman. That was the only time in 1992 that I was a ever, that I was able to look at the sexual abuse. There's so much anger that I went through. And that's why for me, probably one of the things that I had wanted to forget, I never wanted to deal with it, but it was there. That's where the priest, when I went for my, uh, my uh, lawsuit with the federal government, I, uh, I had just started dealing with the sexual abuse because I think it was about 1990. I'm, I forget when I went into the, in front of the judicators at the time because I never talked about it. As I was sitting there with my lawyer, adjudicators in front of me, <clears throat> it hit me. I had a flashback. I've had maybe two other flashbacks. One was that night watchman laying in a fetal position. I just saw myself being just froze up. And then the priest. And I was squirming in my seat. I just felt like throwing up because I could actually feel him and smell him. I couldn't sit still. And finally, my lawyer noticed. He said, Flora, what's going What's wrong? Are you okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. He said, the priest, he's behind me. I could feel him. And I broke down. I was mad. We had to break. That was the first time I had to share something. I had to share my experience. It took me right up till from 1974 till I was in that room with the adjudicators, with my lawyer. That's when it hit me, when I had that flashback. I think it was a blessing that it happened because I had suppressed it for so many years that it had to come out. When it did, it seemed like it was a big relief because there was shame with it. You know, my innocence were taken away. As a, as a young girl. And I was mad. I was angry. I've always talked about uh, my other abuses, but not the sexual abuse. And then I started talking about it slowly. Today, it gets better. I guess I can say for a lot of my Schoolmates, and they're not here with us because they passed away. We just buried my best friend back in, I believe it was in June. She was, my friend was missing for 42 years and they had found her remain. She was murdered in California. We did a documentary of my friend with the California. We got her, you know, she was exhumed, her remains were exhumed and um, we gave her a, a few, you know, a traditional burial. And she was my best friend. She left right after school. A lot of my friends left right after school to the city. 
I didn't, they asked me to go, but I didn't go. I stayed back. So a lot of my schoolmates are gone. They died really young from alcoholism. You know, when you look at the, the history of our people, the impact of the residential school, the damage that they did to our people, you know, so many lo lost lives. Today, they could have been elders. And I know that some of us that are, that are survivors, we talk about the sexual abuse, but there's still some survivors. There's still some victims that haven't talked about their, his, their story. And a lot of them now that are elders, you know, they have health problems, maybe high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer. You know, they have post-traumatic stress. They don't talk about the past. When I look at the intergenerational impact of the residential school, this is probably where it's at. I'm very lucky that I was able to talk about my experiences. When I was doing my social work, I did my two-year diploma program. I was going to go back and do my, my degree program. I went to university two years, and my mom passed away in 2001. I didn't go back. <clears throat> my son passed away in 2004, and I never went back after that. You know, if it wasn't for when I did my social work, it was my daughter that did my papers for me. And I told her, I asked her, can you do this for me? I said, I can't, I don't, I can't get in. I don't know how to get into the computer. I don't know how to type. Could you do my papers for me? I was able to ask for, you know, I had to ask my kids to forgive me for the mother that I was. And today I'm really proud for who they are. They don't drink. They're all parents. I, my oldest son passed away. He didn't have any kids. My second oldest has four kids. Three of them are in university. You know, they've gone through university. My daughter has one daughter. She's in Africa right now. I just wanted to um, thank my kids for being who I am today. They were the first ones that I had to um, apologize to. I had to ask them to forgive me for the mother that I was at the time. And then um, my daughter's been a great help. The other thing that's really important in my life is the, um, when the Pope came to Muscatis, I prepared myself for that. Now is the time for me to do the forgiveness part of my perpetrators. So I worked on that for about three weeks or so. Every day I talk about forgiveness. So by the time the Pope came, I was able to forgive priests and, and all those nuns. I was able to forgive them. And about the, about the reconciliation, I have seen some changes within the... Uh, I've been invited to do some invocations for big companies where we have a Muscochee's Employment Center where, you know, they're working with these big companies where they're training our people and hiring our people. And I think that's part of reconciliation. You know, outside industries are coming into our reservations, uh, you know, inviting our reservation to, you know, to go out there and be a part of their, part of the workforce and they're providing training. I think it's an open book now where the truth has come out. You know, we spoke the truth and now it's the, you know, it's to reconcile with our neighbors, you know, both towns. And we have to continue educating our, the non-Indigenous people, even the immigrants that come into our country, you know, because we were the first people, you know, we were the first people here. And they, you know, they need to understand that this was our land, but we're, you know, but we are sharing. You know, you know, since the beginning of, of times when, the, you know, the foreigners came, we've been able to share what we had and what we have. Because I know our people have been very generous to show them that to come and join us, to come and be a part of our land.
it would be great if the immigrants can walk with us and to understand who we are. But I like to encourage the elders are at home, go and do your recovery. Start talking about the pain that you went through. That's the only way you're going to get that pain out from your system. I think for a lot of us, we've gone through that. We still have that post-traumatic uh, stress because we, when we have flashbacks, those are what happened to us when we were little, when we were children. And I know it's painful for our elders to talk about it, but I think in order for them to get better, they need to start talking about what happened because it's painful, but it's also good. It's rewarding. I see the results with my family. I see it as, as my kids are, they're the parents. And when they started having their own children, I told them, okay, this is gonna be your responsibility. You're gonna raise your kids. Yes, we'll have your kids. We can babysit your kids, but they go home every night. So that's what they've been doing and they're good parents. My oldest son has four kids. Three of them went to university. One is working at a school and she's taken an online medical uh, uh, assistant program. Like I said earlier, my granddaughter, my, my daughter's daughter, she only had one. She's in Africa. She went, she applied for Jane Goodall Foundation and she got accepted and she left on the 8th and she won't be back till November the 8th. And then I have my son, my other son, he has two sons. They're still um, in elementary school. So he's a single parent, but none of my kids drink. They're all responsible. And they've done, you know, they've done a great job in being parent to be parents. And I'm really proud of them. And I wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my story. It's been an honor you know, to be asked. And I want to wish you all the best. And I know that once the reconciliation starts taking its place, I think there's going to be some changes within our communities, within, you know, in our reservations. And I'd like to encourage grandparents, teach your youngsters to speak their language, their, you know, their, their native language, because if we lose it, we lose it. And we cannot, you know, we cannot lose our language. We have to keep it. You know, it's a great day. I, I, I thank the, uh, the grandparents, thanking them too for being there for their children and to continue educating. Hi, hi, thank you. Wow, thank you, Flora. Such a powerful story. I know there's so much that um, our viewers can learn from, especially the rest of Canada, from your story. And we're really grateful for the guests that appear here, especially you. Thank you for sharing with us. It, it really means a lot to us. And I look forward to uh, spending time on your nation. You Multicultural is located on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples. Now the national homeland of the Red River Métis.